All right, guys, it's time for our analysis of book 10 and 11. Now, in book 10, we have the Odysseus's crew has been reduced, so it's only Odysseus, one ship, and 45 of his crewmates. Now, two of those crewmates are officers. We have Politus and um, Eurylochus. Now, Politus and Eurylochus both go ashore on their next island after the Cyclops, um, and they get to Circe's Island. And Odysseus actually stays behind with the ship. Um, it's the first time we see him do that. Usually he's, like, leading the exploration party. But this is after the Cyclops, so maybe he's tired or he's upset or kind of considering the way things went with the Cyclops. So um, Odysseus does stay behind. Now, um, Politus and Eurylochus, they find a, like, cabin or a palace on this island and they hear a beautiful woman's voice singing and you they can hear like the loom which is how they make cloth back then working and so Politus is like oh it's a beautiful woman or a goddess we should go inside and Eurylochus is the only one of that first exploration party who says I don't think that's a good idea but Politus is very popular and so all everyone else goes inside now, Circe is a goddess, but she's also kind of evil. She's an enchantress. She doesn't like humans. She turns all of those men into pigs, but their minds remain human. So it's really important as we study the story that we really consider the emotions of the characters and what they're thinking and feeling as it motivates them through the story. So it would have been one thing if they had been turned into pigs completely, like brain and all, but they're still human on the inside, so they understand that they're being held captive and being treated like animals in these animal bodies. So that's kind of horrific. Now, Eurylochus is completely traumatized, and he begs Odysseus to um, leave. Now, Odysseus, for the second time, ignores the advice of his crewmate. And this is not just his crewmate. This is his officer, someone he respects and elevated. Um, to a position of power in the crew and he's like no way I'm not leaving my men so we can totally see this as a heroic trait of Odysseus he refuses like if his men are in trouble he refuses to abandon them so he he gets help from Hermes who gives him like some protection against Circe's magical powers and he goes to rescue his men doesn't go well. He is immune to her powers, but he, she's still a goddess, so he's stuck with her for a year. Now, in our excerpts, we don't know this part of it. I think they kind of water it down a little bit for you high schoolers, but um, those of you who are reading summaries or are reading the actual story as we go along and not just these excerpts, you'll find that she, he actually fathers a couple children with her, three to be exact, um, before he finally convinces her to let him go. But there's a condition to let letting him go. She says you have to go to the underworld and hear a prophecy by Tiresias before she'll let him go. And once he does that, she does release him and he can continue on his journey. Now this is really interesting because the prophecy of Tiresias is about um, Odysseus and his crew. So Tiresias tells Odysseus that there's two paths he could, his future could take, and one is really terrible, and his whole crew's destroyed, and it'll be years before he goes home, and his wife and child will suffer greatly, and everyone will think he's dead. And then there's this one path, this other path, where if he listens to Tiresias and takes this warning to heart, he will be able to go home. Um, with less tragedy, his crewmates will go with him, but he'll have to like make this sacrifice of animals and all this stuff to make Poseidon not angry anymore. And he'll die, you know, an old man, gently in his sleep. So there's two very, very different paths. Now he gets this warning in advance in the, in the form of this prophecy, so hopefully Odysseus will make the right choice kind of thing. Now, while he's in the underworld, it's really important that you know that we know that he meets one of his crewmates who's died on Circe's Island, and we really see how Odysseus genuinely really cares about his men. He's upset, he's crying, he promises to bury him and fulfill his, his wish, the, his dying wish. 
Now, the other most significant person he meets in the underworld is his own mother. Now, it's important that we know that when Odysseus left for war, his mother was alive. He had no idea she was dead. So seeing her in the underworld was a really huge shock. And even though he loves her a lot and he was horrified to find out she was dead, he still kept her away from this sacrifice of blood because he knows he needs it for Tiresias um, so that he can escape Circe's island. So even though he's shocked and he loves his mother, he was able to keep his head and follow through with his goal, which was to meet Tiresias. So we see a lot of characters heroic characteristics of Odysseus in this section of the Odyssey, which kind of makes up for some of his foolish behavior with the Cyclops. Now, English-wise, there's two things you need to be aware of. The first is we got an epic simile in Book um, 10 with Circe on Circe's Island. So at the very beginning of that section of the story that we read in that excerpt in line 6 to 11, um, the wolves and mountain lions are compared to just normal hounds or like tame dogs and that they like are wagging their tails and they look like they're, oh men, oh good, we can have like snacks from the table and they're very tame. So they're compared to this, this, allu this connection between the wolves and lions and just normal dogs that men would keep. But she's this powerful goddess. So hound dogs for her are these dangerous wolves and mountain lions that terrify the men. So that's a really good epic simile. It really was put there for a purpose to show the difference in their status, human beings and this goddess Circe. It also is to emphasize her power um, because she can tame powerful beings, which makes her even more powerful. So it's really important, this epic simile and the characterization of Circe. So make sure you took note of it. Um, the other, uh, the other fi figurative language we need to take note of is in Book 11, The Land of the Dead. Now, in lines 17 to 20, it makes an illusion. So, um, epic simile, and then illusions are all figurative languages, things that you need to know as an English student. Lines 17 to 20 in Book 11, Land of the Dead, is an allusion to the myth of Hades and Persephone. So he said he had to make a sacrifice to this dark god of the dead, but also to Lady Persephone. Now, he doesn't say much more than that, but it's interesting that Homer adds this kind of allusion to our story because it's a tragedy kind of in itself. So just to remind you guys, if you don't know, in the Greek myth of Hades and Persephone, Hades fell in love with this beautiful spring goddess. Now, he stole her or earth goddess, and he stole her and drags her down to the underworld to be his wife, unwillingly. Now, back then, women didn't have much power, so it's not seen as that shocking. So she weeps and cries and weeps and cries because she's been taken from her mom and her home, and she's not in love with this guy, this god of the dead. She hates it dark in the dark underworld, and it's cold, and she's an earth goddess, so obviously not a happy camper. So fall and winter are when Persephone are trapped in that un is trapped in the underworld and she's so sad and upset and the earth mourns her loss and so it it's the weather becomes cold and harsh and this is because Persef Persephone has been lost to the world. So Hades actually loves her even though he's taking her against her will. He, he loves her and he and she's his wife. So um, he feels bad for her, so ha he releases her back to the world, and then we get spring and summer. But then for the rest of the year, um, he takes her back to the underworld. So she spends six months in the underworld and six months on Earth with her mom and Happy. So those seasons reflect her moods. Um, fall and winter when she's not on, when she's back in the underworld with her husband, and then spring and summer when she's back on Earth with her mother and she's happy. So it's really interesting myth to kind of bring up and like have people like bring it up to their subconscious and have them think about it as we hear this story of Odysseus himself being in the underworld, like kind of against his will. Um, he's a, a living human man. He doesn't belong there. It's very frightening. And it's very upsetting. He has to stay strong. He can't be like distracted or swayed. And he's able to do this. 
so it really shows how amazing and strong he is. And he kind of is like a parallel to Persephone herself in this one. Um, also, the last uh, figurative language we need to be aware of is foreshadowing. So the prophecy is important in that it foreshadows what can happen to Odysseus and it kind of builds anticipation in the reader. But it's also really important that the fact that he has a prophecy at all. So epic heroes are traditionally of great importance. The gods pay a lot of attention to them. And so it's really important that we recognize that Odysseus is an epic hero. He is important enough to deserve a prophecy. He's able to accomplish things no other men are able to do because of his bravery, his honesty, his personality. Um, so he is kind of remarkable to the gods and he's being watched by the gods and he's being helped by the gods and he has this prophecy. So great importance, Odysseus. Um, and we see that through Tiresias's prophecy. So the prophecy can act as foreshadowing. It also acts as a marker for his epic hero status because he's earned it. He's, he's at the level of, of deserving a prophecy. Now, we see prophecies in other stories as well. The one that comes to mind is Harry Potter. So Harry Potter also had a prophecy, and that kind of marks his epicness because he, he, he ranked high enough to, to deserve a prophecy at all. All right, so that was the analysis. It was a brief summary. Uh, make sure you keep track of the epic simile in Book 10, Circe. Uh, the book 10 is about the Circe. It's about Goddess Circe. Oh my gosh, you guys. And that was line 17 to 20. I mean, line 6 to 11, sorry. And then um, in book 11, Land of the Dead, line 17 to 20, we have the illusion of Hades, the illusion to Hades and Persephone's myth. And then we have in line 77 to 117, that prophecy made by Tiresias to Odysseus, um, and this can be considered foreshadowing as well as one of our markers of his, of Odysseus's epic hero standard, uh, status. Sorry about that. So I hope you enjoyed the two chapters this week and you understood the analysis. Make sure you're taking notes. Make sure you look at those guided notes, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!